for research dealing with the adaptive system. But it wasn't until 2013 that the award was given to Beutler and Hoffman for discovery of the toll receptors for macrophages. And that was the first award given <clears throat> for any studies dealing with the innate immune system. Along the way, Menchnikov studied the microbiome and proposed its role in health, disease, and even aging. The word ecology. So our first speaker today, next slide please, is Luba Vikonsky. Uh, she is a noted science writer of articles and books and works at the Weizmann Institute in Rehoboth, Israel, from where she is communicating with us today uh, virtually. She obtained access to previously unavailable information from the Pasteur Institute where Mechnikov had been a director. And she wrote an outstanding book entitled Immunity, How Eli Mechnikov Changed the Course of Modern Medicine. The title of her talk is 19th Century Innate Immunity, Eli Mechnikov and the Immunity War. Our second speaker is Bob Gallo, who received his medical degree from Jefferson, trained in immunology at Yale and Chicago, and spent 30 years at the NIH and the National Cancer Institute, where he was head of the Laboratory of Tumor Cell Biology. Prior to the AIDS pandemic, Bob was the first to identify a human retrovirus, HTLV-1, as causing a human cancer. And in 1982, I heard him present at a Cold Spring Harbor meeting <laughs> the concept, his idea that AIDS was caused by a retrovirus. In 1984, he co-discovered HIV as the cause of AIDS, and his research brought honors from countries around the world, election to the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, about 35 honorary doctorates. And in 1980s and 90s, he was the most referenced scientist in the world. And most remarkably, had the unique distinction of twice winning America's most prestigious scientific award, the Albert Lasker, Albert Lasker Award in Medicine. His lifetime achievements include many discoveries which have led to diagnostic and therapeutic advances <clears throat> in cancer, AIDS, and other viral disorders. And today, his work continues at the University of Maryland, where he is the Gudelsky Distinguished Professor of Medicine, co-founder and director of the Institute of Human Biology, and co-founder and scientific advisor to the Global Virus Network. Recently, he has turned his attention to the innate immune system as it applies to COVID-19 and other viral diseases. And the title of Bob's talk is Reflection on SARS-CoV-2 Pandemic and Innate Immunity. So we will begin with Luba Vikonsky, and it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just put on the slides. Uh, great. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about uh, Ilan Mechnikov. I want to say a word about my virtual background. This is the library of the Pasteur Institute in Paris. And in this institute, Mechnikov worked for the entire second half of his life. And um, he, he waged two major battles in his life. One was uh, to, to advance his theory of immunity, and the other was to defeat aging. And when he died in 1916, it seemed that he'd lost both these battles. But today we consider him a winner. And I will uh, tell you how this happened. Um, and in the process, I hope to give you some insight into the origins Recording of- Recording in progress. 
uh, innate immunity um, research. So let me invite you to Paris at the height of the period that became known later as the Belle Epoque. There is an unusual splurge of creativity in the city. Um, these are some of the iconic works of art that are being created at around that time, and the Eiffel Tower is almost uh, finished for the upcoming World Fair. And that same year, 1888, um, a new institution opens in Paris for a different sort of creativity in science and medicine. It is the Pasteur Institute, and the very first uh, scientist to move into this building is the Russian zoologist Ilya Ilyich Mechnikov. He changes his name, uh, first name, when he comes to France to Eli or Eli in English. And he has come here from Odessa in order to defend his theory of immunity, which is in trouble. Um, who was Mechnikov? Here he is as an angry young man. He is very precocious. He reads Western philosophers. He was born near Kharkiv uh, in Ukraine, which was then part of the Russian Empire. His father came from Moldavian nobility. His mother's parents were Jews who converted to Christianity. Uh, he graduated from Kharkiv University at a young age, at 19, and uh, like all young scientists, he was looking for an interesting research topic. And at the time, uh, one of the central questions in biology was, how are different uh, types of animals related to one another? And Mishnikov was blown away by Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, that was published recently. Uh, and then there was an idea that uh, uh, perhaps you know, that, that Darwin's uh, evolution was still very controversial. And there was the idea that perhaps it could be figured out through embryology. Uh, but uh, embryology of uh, in, invertebrates was not much studied. And uh, in general, they were so diverse that people thought that just there is no way that they could have all come from a common ancestor like, like Darwin had uh, suggested. Uh, but uh, Mishnikov began to study embryos of invertebrates. And he found that they contained germ layers, that they were, they were made up of germ layers, these layers from which different organs germinated just in the same way as vertebrates. So he, uh, in fact, uh, created um, one, established one of the first links between these two types of animals. Uh, other people were studying morphology, and it was just like two, two dissimilar. Uh, but uh, through studying development the way he did, he managed to compare different species and show their unity. Here are uh, two examples of the uh, of the two papers of his, one was in squid, the other was in, in the scorpions. Uh, so he, at a very young age, he became a co-founder of a new branch of science, comparative embryology of, of invertebrates. And he was particularly fascinated by the middle germ layer, the mesoderm, because it wasn't always present in um, invertebrates. Sometimes they, their embryos had only two layers. So um, the, and this mesoderm uh, contained uh, mobile cells uh, that sometimes they stayed on in the adult animal. Uh, and these cells performed a primitive form of digestion in uh, any, uh, animals that didn't have a proper digestive uh, uh, system. So Meshikov conducted uh, extensive studies of, of this digestion. These are some of the drawings from his papers. Uh, and the, these are uh, pictures I found on the internet of the relevant species. And he figured out uh, with dyes that the organelles in which this digestion took place, that, that the, the, the content of the, those organelles was acidic. And he conducted uh, studies uh, of these uh, mobile cells in pretty much uh, every transparent uh, animal that he could lay his hands on. This, this is a partial list from uh, one paper. And then he wrote a review about, about this. Um, he wasn't the first scientist to study intercellular digestion, but he did conduct a very extensive studies and systematic ones. And he, he could uh, draw generalized conclusions. For example, that uh, this was an active process and not merely disintegration. Uh, uh, but when Meshikov was in his late thirties, uh, his, um, his wife, Olga, inherited a large estate. And this came in really handy because he, um, uh, had, he had quarreled 
with the administration at Odessa University. He was their professor of zoology. Uh, and now this, uh, the estate that his wife inherited brought in three times a, a professor's salary. So uh, he, he, he didn't have to find a new job. He, he no longer had to worry about making a living and he could devote himself entirely to science. And with Olga, he traveled to Sicily to the port of Messina where he wanted to study marine animals. And uh, one of the species that uh, he studied was uh, the starfish. And this is a larva of a, a starfish. I was very pleased to find this image because this is just a species that Meshnikov worked on. And he was interested in the mobile cells in, in this uh, larva that uh, performed the digestion. And, and there he had um, an idea for uh, uh, an experiment that became really his most famous uh, experiment. And uh, when he later, when he won the Nobel Prize for this work, he wrote an essay about, about his stay in Sicily. And in that essay, he told the story of how he suddenly had uh, this idea that uh, perhaps the same mobile cells in the larva not perform not only digestion, but maybe they also serve the organism in its resistance against harmful agents. So he ran into the garden and he brought back some thorns from a rose bush and he inserted them under the skin of these transparent larva. And the following day he, in the morning, he, he saw that the experiment had been a success, that the mobile cells indeed ganged up on, on the thorns, uh, obviously in order to protect uh, the, the larva and uh, from this, he drew the conclusion that maybe um, the hypothesis that perhaps the same, same cells um, in the human body also play a protective role. I, at the time, it was most unusual to, to make this conclusion from a, an invertebrate to, to the human body. But Mexico was a, a, an immensely curious man and he had attended courses in pathology and he knew that um, uh, sometimes leukocytes were found at the, at the uh, site of infection, and that sometimes um, they also that they contained um, uh, uh, microbes, uh, and so that uh, uh, so um, uh, th that was how he uh, really sort of made this jump from starfish to, to humans, and he completes this uh, essay by saying that until then, a zoologist, I suddenly became a pathologist. Uh, well, of course, you know, he writes it up as a sort of a eureka moment, but um, we have, you know, we have seen that this was preceded by, by years and, uh, and years of, uh, of studies. And uh, this was how the first modern uh, theory of immunity was born. Um, but just to give you some historic context, at the time there was nothing was known about immunity. There was already some progress in understanding infectious diseases and Louis Pasteur had already started creating the first vaccines, but no one had a clue how the vaccines worked. And a few months earlier, Robert Koch had discovered the bacilli that caused the tuberculosis. But again, no one had any idea how, why some people recovered from TB. Um, the human body was uh, seen as this passive vessel and so people thought that if you know somebody recovered, it was simply because the germs have sort of died um, in and, and of themselves. Um, so when Michiko for the first time published his findings from Sicily in 1883, these are the drawings of this, uh, the starfish larva and the, the thorns and how you know the, how the cells protect the larva. He was very careful and he made just at the end, he made this very cautious statement that maybe the same digestion plays a protective role uh, in protecting the organism against uh, harmful bodies from the, from the outside. But already in that paper, he uh, coined um, new names for these cells. He called them phagocytes from the Greek words for eating and cells. And the process became phagocytosis. And later on, in, a few years later in another paper, he coined the term, ma terms macrophages for big eaters and microphages, smaller eaters, which this is not the terms that's no longer used, but these are neutrophils and sort of the smaller and more mobile um, 
uh, phagocytes. And he continued to study these phagocytes in, uh, in different animals, and he showed that they also play a role in maintenance, in homeostasis, and in consuming atrophied tissues, for example, when a tadpole turns it into a frog. Um, and these are from, from that paper, some uh, drawings of progression of atrophy. And he also made some very modern sounding uh, guesses about uh, the origins of phagocytes that the ones in tissues and in blood must come from the same uh, source. But until then, um, his thinking about phagocytes as a force in immunity uh, was just a brilliant guess. You know, it was just based on intuition. He hadn't seen evidence of that. And then he found evidence in the most unlikely place uh, in an aquarium of a friend of his in Odessa. He saw that there, he, he saw um, uh, Daphnia, these little creatures, the crustaceans that are uh, nicknamed water fleas because they make hopping movements uh, in the water. And they were infected by a fungus. And when Mishnikov looked under the, under the microscope, he saw uh, this collection of uh, uh, phagocytes in its abdomen that tried to, um, to stop, the, to, to destroy, consume the, the fungi. Fungi. And so when, uh, when they managed, then the Daphne survived. And when they didn't, these, these creatures died. Uh, so I wanted to show you this image because it, it continued to inspire Mechnikov for the, throughout the, his entire immunity studies. He later wrote a historic uh, essay about the history of the of phagocyte uh, theory. This was some 30 years later. And he wrote that, that when this theory was attacked from all sides uh, and he asked if he hadn't gotten on the wrong track, all he had to do was to recall the fungal disease of the Daphnia to know that he was on firm ground. And indeed, when he, he started publishing his studies on phagocytosis in immunity, he was really uh, attacked uh, indeed from all sides. Uh, the, his ideas ran uh, totally counter to everything that uh, uh, physicians believe. A pathologist had uh, seen microbes inside cells, but they believed that the cells spread disease and they certainly didn't, didn't fight them. Uh, and some of the uh, uh, responses and, and uh, objections to, to Mechinko's theories were really insulting. Well, perhaps the worst one uh, came from this uh, respectable uh, French physician, Jules Rochard, who said that uh, the phagocyte theory is an oriental fairy tale born in the head of a Cossack. And I, I was wondering why were these attacks so vicious? And uh, I think it's because medicine had recently become a proper science and physicians were really proud of that and everything had to be based on material evidence. And to hear Mishnikov's uh, ideas of these cells that eat microbes, that just, they just sounded so weird. It, it smacked of, of mysticism, of vitalism, all these discredited um, theories. And he wasn't even um, a physician. He was an zoologist. He was an outsider and a Russian. Um, so you know, they, did, they didn't want their, their discipline to be uh, discredited. Uh, so Meshenkov felt that he had to fight back, and that was when he moved to the Pasteur Institute uh, in Paris in order to uh, properly defend uh, his theory. Uh, uh, but then at the time, uh, in Germany, scientists developed uh, a rival theory of immunity. Uh, they said that uh, immunity did not depend on cells, but rather on the body fluids. The, the archaic name for that was uh, humors. So this theory uh, became known as the humoral, humoral theory. Uh, and this is one of the first, uh, one of the most prominent uh, uh, proponents uh, of this uh, uh, doctrine was Emil Bering. And this is one of his first, in one of his first papers, he challenged Meshnikov and he said that he will, he wants to highlight the uh, experiments uh, that show a purely chemical viewpoint for uh, immunity. So um, uh, what happened uh, it, it, later on, Mishnikov called the attacks 
on his uh, theory a war, and that's why I called it uh, immunity war in my book. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, there was a great hostility at the time between France and Germany. Uh, it all you know, went back to the, to the war between France and Prussia a few years uh, before that. Uh, so uh, as soon as Meshnikov aligned himself with Pasteur, it became a matter of honor for German scientists to prove him wrong in order to show who, who was superior in science and medicine and who was the true ruler of, of Europe. So uh, poor Meshnikov had to, to fight his uh, immunity war against the, uh, the backdrop of a, a real war that it, this uh, political hostility uh, certainly added fuel to the fire. Uh, so there were now two really uh, two camps of immunity in Meshnikov with his cellular immunity in France and the German scientists with their humoral uh, immunity. Uh, and in fact, Meshnikov was sort of at a disadvantage from the start because humoral immunity very soon proved uh, very uh, useful. Um, now, in retrospect, uh, we say that Bering discovered antibodies. At the time, at the beginning, uh, scientists didn't know exactly what was in, in, the, uh, in the body fluids. Um, they, knew, they knew that there were some biological chemicals there, but even before that was com completely and fully figured out, uh, Bering started using um, body, body fluids uh, in treating children for uh, diphtheria. This was a serum therapy. They immunized the horses and other large animals against diphtheria and then drew the, the blood. And with the serum, they uh, treated uh, children and you know, most for diphtheria, but adults as well, quite successfully. And then there was tremendous excitement over that. Uh, this was really, the, the, you know, when sometimes we think back about antibiotics as the first successful uh, therapy against infection, but the, in, in fact, it was serum therapy that was there first. And when the Nobel Prizes were uh, awarded for the first time in 1901, the first prize in medicine went to Bering for his uh, serum therapy. Uh, but Mexico was not at all discouraged by, by the fact that uh, uh, his father says he delivered 12 lectures at the Pasteur Institute. Uh, they were later, they came out as a book. It was translated into English and is now considered sort of a, a classic because he uh, laid the foundations for the modern uh, understanding of inflammation. At the time, um, a scientist thought that inflammation was uh, passive and harmful, that leukocytes the passively seeps through blood vessels and cause nothing but harm. And Mishnikov argued that it was actually active and, and healing. And he wrote, for example, that by the blood, blood current, the organism can at any given moment send a considerable number of leukocytes to, to avert the evil. Um, but the, a major point of uh, contention between the two camps was whether phagocytes can or cannot kill the germs. And of course, the German scientists believed that they didn't kill them, that they, they simply picked up dead bacteria. And uh, for example, uh, one prominent bacteriologist, Karl Pflüger, wrote in one, one German uh, journal that, uh, I, I picked this quote, I really like it because it's very poetic, so that the phagocytes are either victims of bacteria that continue their victorious march, or their graves scattered outside the battlefield, meaning that they simply uh, contain dead bodies of the bacteria uh, after the fighting is over. Uh, so Meshnikov had to, to prove that uh, phagocytes did kill bacteria. And in order to do that, he wanted to prove that they picked up live bacteria. So he infected pigeons with anthrax, and then he removed uh, some phagocytes filled with anthrax uh, germs, for example, like the, this one, uh, with this bacterium sticking out. And then he, he applied a solution to kill the cell. And a few hours later, he looked through the microscope and he saw that the bacterium continued to grow. So he wrote that using this method, simple and demonstrative, he was able to show that phagocytes 
capture the bacteria live. But of course, his opponents were not convinced and they continued to uh, show that fluids could uh, kill body fluids, could kill bacteria without any help from cells. And then came the major opponent and final one, uh, this German Jewish scientist, uh, Paul Ehrlich, who developed uh, the notion of receptors. He called them side chains. And he explained that antibodies can neutralize pathogens by fitting, by through this uh, precise fit. Uh, he borrowed uh, a metaphor from uh, organic chemistry, the lock and key. Uh, and this became huge because it, it sort of laid the foundations for the entire pharmaceutical industry of the following 20th century. And Paul Ehrlich himself uh, started developing drugs based on that. He called them magic bullet magic bullets and there was a, a movie was made about him in, in Hollywood uh, that was called Dr. Ehrlich's uh, magic bullet. Uh, now Mishnikov tried to argue that uh, there was no contradiction between phagocytes and receptors uh, but uh, Ehrlich um, would hear none of that. He, he, they knew each other and actually personally Ehrlich liked Mishnikov but um, he, uh, he believed only in chemistry and all this talk about eating cells. To him, it was just Russian mysticism. And uh, he even once wrote to a friend in Denmark uh, that he had great admiration for the then head of the Pasteur Institute, Emil Roux. And he wrote that it was such a shame that such a clear head as Roux should have come strayed so deeply into mysticism and Russian fog. And of course, meaning that, you know, Mishnikov had too much influence over rule. Uh, so um, by then, I, I think most scientists, or at least many scientists, believed in phagocytosis that it was uh, real, but um, there was nothing they could do with it. I mean, it was it just, it was considered medically useless. So uh, nobody really, they really worked on that and they, the future, uh, of medicine seemed to belong to antibodies for new vaccines and new, new um, uh, therapies, therapies. And so the, the worst blow uh, to Meshnikov was uh, when the enemy abandoned him, when uh, German scientists uh, stopped fighting him. And without opposition, he lost steam. And um, he himself too, he stopped working on immunity. He wrote in 1901, he wrote his magnum opus, this immunity and infective diseases. These are some uh, drawings from that book. Um, and then sort of uh, that sort of that seemed, it, it seemed like this was it for the, for the phagocyte uh, theory. Um, but a few years later, when the Nobel Committee decided to award a Nobel Prize for immunity, Meshikov was honored, even though it seemed that the humor camp had won. Um, he was, uh, he had been the first uh, to talk about, you know, the, the immunity that, you know, about the healing powers of the body. And he explained what leukocytes do, which is huge. And uh, he conducted lots and lots of valuable studies. Uh, but the catch was that uh, the prize was uh, shared between him. He, he had to share with pr the prize with Ehrlich. Uh, the Nobel Committee wrote that by uh, dividing the prize between them, they didn't have to take sides in this immunity debate. And of course, in, in retrospect, uh, they were absolutely right. And this is today considered one of the most worthy and most uh, well uh, awarded uh, Nobel Prizes, but both Meshnikov and Ehrlich were unhappy with the sparing. Uh, Ehrlich believed that he deserved the, uh, the prize on his own, and Meshnikov didn't go to the ceremony in Stockholm. Uh, he wrote uh, that uh, he was busy teaching at the Pasteur Institute, but it's more likely that he it was an excuse and he just he didn't want to play second fiddle to Ehrlich uh, in Stockholm. And also by then, when he wrote his uh, this major work on immunity, he was in his mid 50s, sorry, mid 50s, he was 56. And um, he started to worry about aging. So he 
a switch. You know, by now, he already had a completely new direction of studies. Um, I, he he uh, developed this theory that it was the content of the, uh, the microbes in the intestines, what today we call the microbiome, that they were responsible for aging, that they released poisons that somehow improperly stimulated phagocytes, and that's what caused the proper in the atrophy of, of tissues. And he started studying uh, old animals. Um, this is a study of parrots. Parrots are really long-lived birds. Uh, I, this is a comparison between the brain of a young parrot and an old parrot, which has uh, neurons that were uh, uh, swallowed up by phagocytes that he called the new neuronophages. Uh, and then he um, also uh, started writing philosophical books uh, about this. And this is the first one, uh, just called The Nature of Man. And in this book, he coined a new term, gerontology. Uh, and he called on other scientists as well to study aging in a systematic way. So. Uh, for the third time in his life, he became a founder of a new science. And he uh, wrote about nature sort of in very broad terms um, and about uh, various, what he saw as disharmonies of human nature. And he thought that the, the worst dis disharmony was uh, between the shortness of life and the infirmities of old age and the strong will uh, to live that, that people continue to, to experience. So he thought that this was this, the greatest uh, disharmony of, of all. Um, uh, but note the uh, subtitle, Studies in Optimistic Philosophy. And uh, when Meshnikov uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize, the New York Times ran a very long interview with him that also sub was subtitled, The Apostle of Optimism, and then, um, in a bunch of intellectuals in Paris created a club to promote optimism. And they loved to invite Mishnikov to their dinners and he talked about the prolongation of life. Uh, he believed that um, human life should be much longer than, than it is. And he uh, thought that sort of the normal cycle of life should be perhaps like something like 150 years. And he believed that if people live through what you know, what you call the full and normal cycle, they, they will um, lose the life instinct and they will develop a death instinct and uh, they, will, they will die willingly. Uh, and then he wrote another philosophical book called The Prolongation of Life, Optimistic Studies. And I wanted to know why did optimism, uh, the, the word optimism, the, the concept come up so, so much? And I learned that at the turn of the 20th century, pessimism and optimism were most viewed as philosophical outlooks rather than sort of the states of mind, the way we view them today. Um, and in fact, this dichotomy between pessimism and optimism was kind of central to intellectual life in Europe. So it was only natural for Meshnikov to, to define where he stood on this uh, issue. But he wasn't an extreme uh, optimist. Uh, people were then asking in the same way as we do now, is the world getting better? And an extreme optimist would say that surely it is, but Meshnikov didn't think so. Um, he didn't think the world was getting better on its own, but he did think that it could be improved with, with, the, with the help of science. Uh, he wrote that human constitution is mutable and can be altered to benefit humanity. And uh, that's why he defined himself as an optimist. And in fact, at the time, pessimism was uh, a much more uh, popular philosophy. So here again, he was sort of going against the, the general tide. And he was at the same time as, as being a visionary, he was a very practical man. So um, he came up with a, a solution to uh, aging, or at least uh, a way to delay it as he hoped. Uh, believe it or not, uh, this is a probiotic yogurt, this, uh, what you buy today in the supermarket. Um, these are uh, pills of lactic acid bacteria. Uh, Meshnikov uh, came up with this idea that yogurt could 
delay aging because it contains the bacteria that they turn uh, milk sugars uh, into acid. And this, this acid in a test tube, it killed uh, uh, other bacteria. So he thought that uh, in the, if the same thing happens in the intestines and if, if these bacteria kill um, the, uh, the harmful ones, then uh, perhaps aging could be delayed. So um, this started a yogurt craze all over the world. And Meshikov himself was eating yogurt uh, three times a day. And um, he also tried to prevent um, germs from getting into the body. He ate everything boiled and he, he sterilized utensils in the restaurant before, before eating for himself and for his guests. And people were all over the world buying yogurt and, and these pills. These pills have Meshinkov's name on them. He uh, allowed one company to, to use, to promote them using his name. And he became what today we would call a media personality. He was already famous by, by then, but uh, the, the uh, yogurt uh, really made him, uh, you know, sort of a household, household name. And uh, this started the modern yogurt industry. Until then, yogurt was this obscure ethnic food. And this is a cartoon of Meshnikov uh, showing him turning out the centenarians. And then in the middle of all this uh, optimism and uh, hope for long life and uh, on all the, these uh, studies, uh, World War I broke out. And uh, in a way, it, it killed Meshnikov because he so believed in rational thinking and progress uh, in science and this sort of senseless killing the massive killing just devastated him and he developed uh, severe heart uh, trouble and the heart failure and he died at the age of 71. And so his uh, uh, theories of aging were not really accepted anyway in the scientific community. And when he himself died, not even halfway to his goal of 150. So that sort of, that was pretty much it for those uh, ideas. and. Uh, no one was working on the on the phagocyte theory by then, so it really seemed that he lost, you know, on both fronts. Uh, but um, today, in, in in retrospect, we uh, he is considered uh, the founding father of innate immunity research, and Ehrlich as the as the founder of adaptive immunity research. And um, I'm, I'm sure many of you know about friendly collaborations between scientists who work on these two arms of the immune system. But uh, uh, perhaps, you know, if you, uh, when you think back, you know, that it wasn't always that as friendly at all. So maybe we can more appreciate more the, the collaborations that, uh, that exist today. Um, and what happened in the past few years also that uh, microbiome became a totally legitimate the topic in aging research, research and it probably plays um, a role in the, uh, in the aging process. So um, about a century after Meshnikov died, I uh, conducted uh, a search in PubMed to see what happened with uh, phagocyte research. These, these are uh, the number of studies per year so like, like Dr. Arias said, there was really nothing for the longest time, it was just you know, forgotten. And then there's this, this, this tremendous surge of, of studies. Uh, and the same thing you see, the same uh, graph you see when you do a search for macrophage. And um, I'm sure this would have been a, a great source of optimism for Meshnikov. And in fact, it puts uh, his, optimistic philosophy in a new light in the sense that, uh, you know, the, uh, the optimism that can come from, um, you know, for the advances in science and medicine that, that can come from this surge of studies in innate immunity. And these are some of the covers, recent covers of journals with uh, Mishikov's uh, picture on the, on the cover. Uh, so I would like to end with a quote that I used as an epigraph for my book. Uh, it's from Louis Pasteur. I think it's really appropriate for Mishnikov that the scientist must concern himself with what one will say about him in a century rather than with current insults or compliments. Thank you very much.
And thank you very much, Fuba, for a really uh, wonderful uh, uh, presentation uh, and of the great debt that we have <laughs> to uh, scientists who uh, can be more concerned about the future than about the current state of turmoil. So now we'll uh, proceed to uh, uh, Bob Gallo, who's going to talk more about innate immunity now. Bob? Yes, uh, thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much, uh, Wynn. I want to say from this opening slide, first, thank you for inviting me and thank you for the people attending. But I want to say a contrast uh, to Luba's talk. She, she mentioned the very beginning of innate immunity. There's no doubt about that. And the focus is on macrophage, as you heard, and sometimes granulocytes, the smaller body. Uh, but the kind of innate immunity I'm talking about is not guarding against larger organisms like fungi or bacteria, but rather against viruses. So I won't be talking about those kind of cells, which are generally, as far as we know, not so important for viruses. But uh, things like what we call today in, in the immune system, natural killer cells, NK cells, and things like molecules, instead of the antibodies, we'll be talking about an, an innate immune molecule, interferon, uh, the various interferons. But before I get to that, I wanted to look at the first part of my talk is on some reflections about the recent pandemic, but pandemics in general as well. Uh, so we go to the next slide. Yeah, I, I want to remain poor. Then the outline is here. I would like to discuss common features of pandemics, a few lessons from HIV and AIDS because it's the last pandemic till this one, but the great difference from that from other pandemics there was no way to prepare for HIV AIDS as we hear we can prepare for pandemics. Certainly no way to prepare for HIV and AIDS. So although public health things are in common and you, and you can do certain public health things one pandemic to another or epidemic to another, microbes can differ, viruses can differ so much that it's hard to draw lessons all the time one from another. I then would like to move into SARS coronavirus 2 completely. Um, and point out some aspects that I believe strongly that pan means all, and this must involve the whole world, both in taking care of the whole world, not just ourselves, because it'll be in our interest, not just doing the right thing. But also we need the cooperation of medical science doctors everywhere. The complexities of therapy, I don't think I'll have time to get that back. And should we be so worried about where this thing originated and how it originated? I think not, but that's my opinion. The vaccines are terrific, but they're not long lasting and that was predictable. And they're still unavailable for many people. And the mechanisms, well, they're not really certain. We believe it's neutralizing antibodies attacking the spike, but there's little proof that that there's some suggestions of other things going on. It's likely that it plays a substantial role, but maybe not the only role. And then finally, but taking up at least a third of the talk, I'll focus on innate immune stimulation. I have to talk a bit about innate immunity in general, and then should we, could we stimulate it deliberately by repurposing some old vaccines that are, can be broadly active, that even though they're made against some other microbe, some other virus, could work against SARS-2 or against respiratory viruses in general. And there's a lot of evidence for this. I want to make a statement from the start. I contributed nothing to innate immunity advances. Uh, you know, I worked a little bit on interference, basic mechanisms of how they blocked retroviruses, but that was in the 70s. And I didn't probably even recognize I was working on innate immunity really. But what I have been is impacted by it and thinking of how we could have taken advantage of it and should have and should for the future uh, in this regard from new epidemics or pandemics. There have been in my mind, six great pandemics in the past hundred years. It's not like some commentators have stated that they come about every year or every two years or something like that. These are widely apart, except for influenza. That recurs and if we're unlucky and you get the wrong kind of flu virus, we develop another epi and then sometimes real pandemic. So we do have the flu of 1918, the great killer, the Spanish flu, so to speak. 
the Russian flu of 1977, the swine flu of 2008, which is almost a pandemic. So flu is the big problem. And of the great pandemics, there are four, four are of, uh, or rather, uh, yeah, are respiratory. These are underlined. So there are the, the three flus and of course the current SARS. And there are different kinds of viruses, but again, really four. And they're about 30 years apart. So if we just say flu and use the great flu, that's a real big pandemic. Then we jump to polio, you know, about 30 years later. And again, HIV of the late 70s, about 30 years later. And then SARS about 30 years later. Whilst HIV continues and SARS is still continuing. And in my mind, the lessons are of each are forgotten of by the next. And if you read Oshansky's book, speaking of another historian about polio, he will point out how the lessons of the great flu were forgotten. If you look at it, the story of HIV, and to the best of my knowledge, I can say being there, I believe strongly, we forgot the lessons of polio or a flu. And of SARS, I think some of the lessons of HIV were certainly forgotten as well. So I'll come back to that point about how we remember or don't remember. So as I already said, the pandemics, excepting flu, have been about a generation apart, about 25 to 30 years. There's been many epidemics in between or concurrently, like dengue, the first SARS, MERS, other influenza strains that I've mentioned, chikungunya, especially in India, West Nile, Ebola, Zika, and others. All of these are caused by RNA viruses. Most are respiratory, acute viruses. They have some other common characteristics. They all reproduce at high rates. I don't consider finding a respiratory virus as really a discovery because they're usually just dripping off the tongue or the mouth. It's obvious that they're the cause of the disease and it's obvious you can isolate them easily. RNA viruses all have high mutation rates. We don't have time to get into why this is true, but they, they mutate a lot. This is nothing new with SARS coronavirus too. The current pandemic, people think this is unique uh, sometimes, and that you know, of course, all RNA viruses have this high mutability. And except for HIV, except for HIV, they are easily transmissible and easy to find. This doesn't, doesn't mean anything. However, the most common feature, again, this is my viewpoint. It's an opinion of any pandemic can be described in one word. Change, it, the word is change. That can be change in a virus or change in society or both. For SARS coronavirus 2, we do not know the identity of the change, but likely involved genetic changes in a previously existing coronavirus in the spike region in particular. But was there a social change? If so, we haven't identified it. Was there a social change in the Wuhan region? Um, um, let's consider some past pandemics and epidemics. Polio, what was the change? It appears that polio virus was a change not by society as much by the, as by the virus, a genetic change. It, was an, it is an enterovirus, a virus of the gastrointestinal tract of a particular kind. We won't go into the classification. It's an RNA virus. Yes, of course, we just discussed that. And from a, har a relatively harmless virus of the gastrointestinal tract, it mutated to change its tropism. That is what it targets, what its receptor is. And it became neurotropic, targeting the cells of the central nervous system and causing the disease we call poliomyelitis. What about changes in ancient time? We have changes in society. When Romans went to the Eastern Mediterranean, new epidemics and pandemic followed. We have changes when the new world was discovered and Europeans came here on both sides of the sea. We have on a minor scale, non-viral disease like let's say Lyme disease. In our area, we have deer in our backyard. Deers have deer ticks. Deer ticks carry the Lyme agent and we can have not pandemic, but we get local epidemics from it. Legionnaire's disease came with refrigeration and air conditioning. That's a change. What happened with HIV? With HIV, 
we have viruses in the rainforest going from one primate into man periodically? Why did this become epidemic and then pandemic? We assume that there was a genetic change in one of the monkey viruses known as the simian immunodeficiency virus or SIV. But then the colonial powers rather abruptly left Africa and people moved from rainforest into towns like Kinshasa. There apparently, this is not science now, but social history, there was an increase in prostitution, virus concentrated. And then what was local became global by post-World War changes we can describe as the airplane, tourism, increased sexual promiscuity, blood going from one nation to another. For example, Japan doesn't use its own blood, uses blood from America and from Europe. And uh, the insane habit of intravenous drug abuse becoming almost global. These things would, could lead to a fluid born infection, rather hard to transmit, becoming commonplace. That's in any case, how I would view it. Now, but does finding the origin of a virus matter that much? Well, normally we're curious, we wanna know that answer and I'm all for it. But I think we've gone a little far with this and we've pushed a bit China to the wall. Because I don't think it matters that much. It matters a bit, but not much. Let's take SARS coronavirus too. What if it was born in the market? We, we prove that. And involved in a mammalian intermediate and we prove that. Let's say it wasn't in the market, but we directly came from bat to, to man or bat to another mammal to man. Well, more, that might that would be useful to knowing what mammal, but we would already know what to do about the markets. We could act on that now. And what if it's a lab leak? We have good evidence, I would say now, um, most of the scientific community would agree that this is not a laboratory created virus. If it's not a laboratory created virus, could it be a lab leak? We can almost never rule that out from any virology lab with any virus. So, but do we know what to do without proving it? Yeah, we know what to do without proving it. We could, for example, have greater precaution on who works on these things, require special training. For example, the gain of function research in which you deliberately manipulate viral genes so that they infect human cells better so that we can be better prepared for an epidemic or pandemic by such a virus if it mutates in that direction, we could have greater reviews of such work. Virologists, including myself, are prone to want to get funded. And you're curious, you wanna know answers. So you want the science to go forward, we still do. But we might take a lesson from the pages of molecular biology, where when gene cloning came to the forefront, they had meetings in California called the Asilomar Conferences, which ultimately led to having reviews for gene cloning of what was ethically advisable. What was the risk benefit value here or ratio? And they used intelligent lay people to be on some of the review bodies. We could do that now in virology so that you don't just have the virologist's opinion. So my view in the end is, it is really not worth pushing China in this. In the end, we will only succeed in pushing them away from collaboration. I don't see what there is to really gain. Uh, this is another general comment that I'd like to make. I wanna pick up what are controversial things in my mind or things I don't agree with. I frequently hear commentators say, we will never forget. We will forget. The lessons of prior fire virus pandemics showed to me that roughly after a generation or so from the time of the end of a pandemic or the end of a problem, we forget in every single case. I don't think this will be any different. And the story of HIV is particularly relevant. Actually, it's not even now often currently listed as one of the recent pandemics, believe it or not. It's still ongoing, but it's sometimes forgotten to be listed as one of the, one of the previous pandemics. I'm gonna show just a couple of slides on HIV. Lessons from HIV are, it's a very different kind of virus. But let me say that the slide begins by saying remarkable biases of the recent past in the 1970s. I came to the National Institutes of Health in the middle of the 1960s. And at that time there, in my mind, at least from where I sat, there was a strong respect for virology, for viruses causing serious disease, for the possibility of epi and pandemics. But by 1970s, very different. 
I would say that I heard statements like listed on the top here, uh, retrovirus, uh, excuse me, serious epidemic infectious diseases are over in the industrialized world. Therefore, therefore we can forget about it. It was something you wouldn't say today because indeed we at least are supposed to care about other nations and other parts of the world, but also it's in our interest to care, isn't it? So it was said that, oh, well, those are problems for the tropical disease institutes only, and that the funding should go to degenerative diseases and forget about infectious diseases. Having not the wisdom to think it through that sometimes the degenerative diseases are caused by a more, let's call them slow virus, difficult to find, difficult to brew, like the recent evidence that a common infection of humankind, Epstein-Barr virus, a herpes virus that about 95% of us have, may in some people be the cause of multiple sclerosis. We need to understand why it's so limited in its hit to cause the disease, but that's where we are. The second was that a certain category of viruses, like the what is the AIDS virus, a retrovirus, don't infect humans. And there were many reasons for this. This was the 70s. This was not a good time for some of us to be working and looking for human retroviruses. And it was, and there's strong, uh, well, there's proof, not strong evidence. There's proof for the statement that it was felt that no viruses cause cancer, and no infection causes cancer, or plays any role in cancer in man. It was a, a rather formal conclusion in a 1974 meeting on the origins of human cancer at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories. By the early 1980s, these prejudices, these biases were overcome. Viruses are now known to be involved in the cause or at least a stage of the origin of a bit over 20% of human cancers. Retroviruses were indeed discovered in man and shown to cause serious disease. Look at bullet three, one of the great pandemics in history, AIDS appeared caused by another retrovirus. Now, originally I was thinking of talking about how these advances occurred, but there is not time for that. So I'm gonna go just use this as what's called the Sedgway to get into SARS coronavirus 2 again, but more detail. The HIV blood test was a key advance. It saved the blood supply and prevented blood transfusion infection as well as the consequent infections from recipients, allowed the epidemic to be followed for the first time because we had a test. You didn't have to wait for the 10 years or five years or eight years for the person to develop AIDS to know how this thing was spreading we could tell within two weeks when antibodies would appear. The cell culture system we developed allowed the first screening of anti-HIV drugs. And when therapy became available by the blood test, we could determine who to treat, as well as to block mother to child transmission. For my colleagues and myself, it was also critical that it verified HIV as the cause of AIDS. Because virus isolation was very tricky, very difficult. Patients had very few T cells from which the virus had to be obtained. It was a real kind of nightmare, but the blood test allowed verification. People could do this test all over the world and verification came rather easily. So we switched back to SARS coronavirus too in COVID. And I would say, we're going to, again, it must involve the world, the complexities of therapy. Why are the complexities of therapy? Because unlike AIDS, the virus doesn't stay around giving you opportunity to have drug therapy that targets the virus very quick in the early phase when you need antiviral therapy. But with good diagnostics, you could do that if you had it done <clears throat> extensive diagnostics and you do it rapidly. We have pretty substantial major available vaccines, but they're not available for everybody. And they're also, and it's important to emphasize that they don't last long, five to six months. You have to remember that. That's a key point. They don't last long. And that was highly predictable from the genome published in 2020, January 10th, by the Chinese. You could predict that this would be the case. So that's a problem you got to keep boosting. Is there a role for innate immune stimulation by repurposing old vaccines that are broadly reactive and might help? Now it's time to focus in that way for, for a minute. But first, what happened to diagnostics? Uh, Accurate and sensitive diagnostics are key to any pandemic or epidemic. The reasons are obvious, often underappreciated, and we did rather poorly in the early days of the current SARS coronavirus pandemic. Why? Well, well, number one, there wasn't any responsible group or groups. 
it has been said that this was a problem for CDC to solve, but that's really not true. It's not in CDC's orders to go get blood tests or particular tests, though they're interested every time and they try. The, the HIV test was not developed at CDC, but it was developed in my lab at NIH. So NIH sometimes contributes to testing. I think we just didn't get involved because people thought it was easy. There's a lot of virus, it's obvious. You can make a diagnostic test pretty fast. So I think it was a failure of all of us that we didn't get involved. I, my institute certainly didn't get involved. There's also cross reactions with rather harmless seasonal coronaviruses that made it a little more difficult at the beginning. There's insufficient global cooperation. Perhaps, perhaps there was also some fear of this virus leading people, scientists, medical scientists, maybe at the beginning to stay away. So here are some specifics in my mind. I wanna be sure that I leave you with before we go further to the innate immunity. This is a virus easy to, suck, to find, self-evident as a cause, needs to involve the world, already said that. It's essential in my mind for China, US, and Europe, when I include Europe, I include Russia, to have close collaboration. Knowing the origin, in my view, is not critical, as often stated, and can be harmful to push it too far. We discussed diagnostics already and the complexity of therapy. We discussed a little bit the vaccines, the variants. They're likely to be covered. Most variants are likely to be covered by the current vaccine, but the limited availability even now for the world. Now we come to, is, the, is there a role for stimulating innate immunity? What are its benefits? What are its limits? Well, how can we stimulate it? Well, we might find drugs to do it, and that's probably going to be much more acceptable to, let's say, the U.S. Army to have a pill in the pocket of a soldier going into a new area. I'll come back to that in a moment, but we know how to do it now with old vaccines, measles, mumps, rubella, oral polio virus vaccine, the vaccine of Sabin, not the dead one of salt, doesn't work so well, live shingles virus intranasal flu virus as opposed to the one that you get injected with. They'll all work, even the injectable ones, the dead ones, but not to the extent that the live ones do. Yellow fever, rotaviruses, and the bacterium BCG, which is for tuberculosis, but repurposed for a new respiratory epidemic or pandemic. What's the importance of innate immunity in controlling SARS coronavirus 2? Innate immunity, before we look at this slide, it's important period. As you'll see in a moment from my slide, 95% of all, uh, well, all, all creatures have innate immunity and 95% have only innate immunity. It's only we vertebrates that evolve the adaptive immune response. 95% of living organisms have only, again, innate immune mechanisms and get protected. Let's stop for a minute and think how many, I think if you're over 20 or 30 years old, you know you've had infections that went nowhere. One day you woke up with a small headache, maybe fatigue, or maybe you just had a chill or two, and then they, possibly a low grade fever, but may, usually not. But the next day you were better. You were infected by a virus. Well, how did it get better? Did the virus run out of cells to infect? Of course not. The virus decided to go away? Of course not. It's your innate immune system. It took it away. And that has happened to you over and over and over again. Innate immunity doesn't protect against disease so much. It prevents completely against infection. I've said that I like to use the analogy of the end of the Western Roman Empire. When around in the mid 400s or so, Rome is under siege. At the gate, you have the, pre the premier legionnaires to try to block entry. But when they break through, secondary auxiliary and other legionnaires are going to come into the fray. That's the adaptive immune system. But at the beginning, it's all the innate immune system that blocks infection. I was struck by several things in the beginning of the pandemic that said to me, it's extremely important for this coronavirus. First of all, I began learning from my colleague at the FDA, a Russian scientist, whose parents were well-known Russian virologists. His name is Konstantin Shumakov. And he told me about the work of his parents with Albert Sabin, 
when they did the first polio trials of the live oral polio vaccine in Russia. But 20 years after that, that was the 50s, in the 70s, his mother observed in analyzing data that particular year that people who were just vaccinated with the live polio virus were protected against influenza, or at least it was correlating, better than with the flu vaccine. So they made note of that. And then there, you, they found out there is indeed a literature on it scattered here and there, never organized well, never funded well, undernourished, underfunded, understudied. But it's heavy in the literature and it's come back today. I was aware of that. And I started thinking about it with this pandemic because I realized and read a book on the immunology of bats. The bats all harboring coronaviruses. The bats all over the place have these viruses. They live with it. They have a high metabolic rate, yet they have a long lifespan. But how do they hold these coronaviruses in check? Certainly it was not by antibodies. It's not by the adaptive immune system. They have a constant, we call constitutive level of innate immune response by having the natural killer cells activated at low level and present. This is part of the innate immune system, as well as the molecule interferon present at low level. Too high, you'll get inflammation and many other problems, but it's a low level and that leads them to control. Then I noticed that the genetic information in the SARS coronavirus too is rather overly chuck full of genetic sequences that target specifically innate immunity. What we call the gene non-structural protein one, non-structural protein six, non-structural protein 14, all have the capacity of interfering with innate immunity. That said to me that this virus is very much frightened by innate immunity, but it's gotta be there in advance. Clinically, beginning with the work at Stanford by Balachandran and his colleagues, there's a better prognosis correlates mainly with a new innate immunity parameters. That's been seen over and over. Now, durability is said to be the main advantage of the conventional adaptive immune stimulating vaccines, the specific vaccines like measles, like polio, like the current SARS coronavirus 2 messenger RNA vaccines, et cetera. But the classical vaccine approach with SARS coronavirus 2 does not yield antibodies that are durable. And what about the durability of the innate immune response? I have to tell you, I'll come back to it in the next slide, I think. We really don't have a lot of data on it. We know it's at least a month, but there is evidence with BCG from a work of a Romanian scientist, Natia, working in Holland, that with BCG, he measured it lasting six months. No, you'll never get lifetime like you'll get with polio or smallpox or, or you know measles, et cetera. But there are places and times for it, as I'll try to argue soon. There's also clinical evidence that the higher levels of interferon, IFN, correlate with better prognosis. Now there are several correlative positive clinical studies, studies in man that are scattered here and there a Russian study, a study in India, a study in Brazil or Mexico, but also in animal studies, for example, at NIH by Dr. Shear and his colleagues with BCG. For example, a group at UCSF and Stanford that just published on using the oral polio virus again, but this time a mutated form of it that they gave a special abbreviation to so that it only infects once, cells once like in the gut, and then no more, it's not able to infect anymore. And they, do, they showed dramatic protection against SARS coronavirus too, as well as being able to use it therapeutically. So if you use it early on. So these studies to me argue rather strongly that we better pay more attention to innate immunity. Let's look at some properties of innate immunity contrasted to the adaptive immune system. I think if you drop down to um, the first one in red. When you develop antibodies for the first time when you're exposed to a new vaccine, it takes weeks to make the antibodies, two, three weeks. To get real immune response, you know, it's weeks. It also takes usually more than the two years that it took this time to develop the vaccine. 
that averages more like four to five years. And as you know, in some parts of the world, we still don't have it. So what do you do? Innate immune vaccines, or innate immune stimulation, let me put it that way, occurs within an hour. So if I go to my drugstore and get MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, one hour later, I'll have innate immune stimulation likely lasting for at least a month. And it'll be, in my view, effective. The adaptive immune system comes from the lymphoid system. It involves cells we call B cells or B lymphocytes, T cells, B lymphocytes. It also includes antibodies and also T cells that kill specifically. Please no. Whereas somebody needs to turn their, their um, microphone off because you're interfering. Innate immunity is coming from myeloid cells, myeloid cells from the bone marrow and local. And they, and they lead to mainly, but not solely by a long shot, interferon, interferons and natural killer cells. I've already mentioned that they're present in the adaptive immune system is only in vertebrates, but 95% nine, of species have only innate immunity. And we talked about durability already. The safety of a new vaccine is usually unknown and variable. We already know the use of old vaccines. We know what safety they have. Cost, a new vaccine is relatively costly. Repurposing old vaccines is very inexpensive. OPV or polio would be about 12 cents a pill. Might not be able to use it. So if you go to MMR, it's probably a few dollars. The funding for research and development of adaptive immune system is in the billions for innate immunity, very poorly studied. I like to say it's understudied and undernourished. These are the opportunities in my mind for using broad stimulating innate immune stimulating vaccines at the beginning of any new epidemic or pandemic to fill in the gap of time between the appearance of the new epidemic and developing an effective and durable specific vaccine. For countries that cannot gain access to the specific vaccine for even longer periods of time, the cost can be very low. This is something to think of now. If there's a problem with durability of the specific vaccine, like this one lasts six months, I would say max, or if that vaccine is unable to handle some variants that emerge, think of this approach. Finally, what about putting them together? Some people think maybe the innate immune stimulation would inhibit the development of the specific vaccines working as well. I think the opposite is very, very likely true. And there's nothing to suggest the opposite. You likely make the current vaccines work even better. The problems of going forward with innate stimulating old vaccines, I think most important is the lack of understanding among population and even scientists, including until this epidemic myself, and very little research support. Two is a fear that this may cause confusion in the public, and that I understand, and lead to greater vaccination resistance. Look what's going on right now. Durability, likely a few months though may be better than we believe. Unjustified fear of side effects. The fifth is concerns that they may interfere with specific vaccines, as I mentioned, but that I think is the opposite of be true. Last, no market value. They're very inexpensive and you can't patent. That's all I wanted to say. Um, I think I, 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 I know I finished in time. <laughs> Maybe too early. <laughs> I don't know if you got your, you didn't get your money's worth. And I blame my friend Winda for that because he made me take out a lot of slides. <laughs> no, I think it was better this way. And we have more time for any discussion. And I was very happy to follow Luba, who made a very, very nice introduction to this whole field, of which I knew, I knew the name and I knew macrophage in him, but I sure didn't know all those details. Appreciate it. What happened? Um, Luba. Um, yes, I yeah. see that there was a question about autoimmunity. Um, where is that question? Question number one that um, 
Did Mechnikov have any, have any idea regarding phagocytes or the innate immune system turning on its host? Um, I haven't seen any evidence of that, any mention in his work about uh, autoimmunity. He did talk about the inappropriate role of phagocytes in aging, but this was, you know, he believed that they uh, speeded aging by causing atrophy, but not, uh, not autoimmunity. Uh, Luba, there's a question that was asked. From the many discoveries made by Mechnikov, what do you think was the most exciting and important to him? <laughs> um, well, I, I think phagocytosis was his baby for sure. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I think the very first, the very first discovery, you know, the, the fact that he wrote, you know, when once as soon as he got a Nobel Prize, he wrote that essay about the, his experiment with the starfish larva. I think that was his, you know, I would, my guess would be that this was his favorite. Uh, it was also asked whether, uh, I guess you answered this partly, but the, the, the question was, uh, is the fact that Mechnikov was a uh, uh, biologist and uh, dealing with the organisms, uh, non-vertebrates, in which the innate system is the only system that's present, did that play a part in his uh, uh, attitudes toward the suggestion uh, that the adaptive system wasn't relevant or wasn't important? Uh, I think, uh, look, I mean, I, I can, you know, only say, say, you know, what I think. I don't know what, what you know, uh, how it really was, but I, I think he, there was a bias there, absolutely. And, um, you know, he did work with vertebrates. He worked with the rabbits and with the rats. And, but for example, he was never interested in lymphocytes. And maybe that's because, uh, you know, the invertebrates, his uh, sort of original uh, the, uh, species that he worked with that don't, don't have them. Uh, but I think more than that, um, be, be, you know, beyond the bias, I think, uh, he wasn't willing to to really admit the, the sort of decisive role of antibodies because it was an either or you know it was a war it was sort of the life and death death thing if he if he accepted that uh, antibodies were really the main thing then his life's work would go down the drain he he did uh, accept uh, their uh, function sort of a little bit towards the end but he always thought that this was secondary and that the phagocytes were the predominant one. Did Mechnikov ever consider the idea that the innate system could sort of turn on itself and produce a, what today we would call autoimmunity? No, no, that I just, uh, I just, I answered that before. Sorry, I read that, that question from the, the prompt that I have here in the chat. No, I don't. Um, uh, I didn't. I didn't see any evidence of that. Only in atrophy in old age. That's not. But not in autoimmunity. What then is autophagy? Sorry. No? I said then. What is autophagy? Aut when, ah. when, you're, when you're eating, it's normal <laughs> physiological physiology. But you eat your own junk, right? Um, yeah. You know, degradation. Right. Uh, well, okay. It's not. This is a, a bad question. A bad comment. It'll take us away from reality. Uh, so, okay, Bob, um, there are a series of questions here, or quite a few. I'm trying to get them organized here. Oh, one is Do you think the flu vaccine activates uh, innate immunity? Why not? I, of course, yes. Especially if it's live one. Remember, I said there's intranasal and there's the injectable one, but the intranasal one for sure. And I, I would say even the dead one very light. You some innate immunity. If you don't look, you have to understand. If you don't have innate immunity, you can't make antibodies. You don't make antibodies. You don't get a that kind of response. It maybe the memory after when you repeatedly vaccinating with a specific vaccine. But in order to begin 
any vaccination, you, you need innate immunity. So yeah, sure, they, they, they will give some innate immunity. It's just that the dead vaccines uh, don't work as well. That seems clear. It's not as big a stimulation, okay? But yeah, so if guys get flu vaccine. Yeah, there's a question raised about the oral polio vaccine, uh, which clearly was associated uh, very infrequently, fortunately, but was associated with uh, the clinical disease. Uh, that is- uh, How could you get around that issue? I think it's rather simple, I think. Uh, first of all, it, 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 it's, it's, so, it's one in every few million doses in an unvaccinated population. In the United States, we took it between 1962 and 2000, the live oral polio. There wasn't a single case, from my understanding, not a single case. And the number of doses were billions, not a single side effect major, not a single polio case. So in a vaccinated population, there is no problem. And in other populations, they're doing it because they have to and they need it because that's what they have and that's what they can afford. And it's about one in 2 million. Now, if you planned it, and we are vaccinated with IPV, it wouldn't be a danger for us. But if you wanna be sure, you use something that can't revert. I mean, Gates is made, Gates is, I shouldn't say Gates, his foundation um, funded some people to make a serotype two that can't revert. And I think it's only the serotype two that does revert. I don't think one and three revert. So there's easy ways to get around it. Um, that's it. I think it's a mistake to avoid using OPV. From talking the people I know and respect the most, I would say have the same opinion that are the best polio virologists. I think it's Eckhart Wimmer in New York and it's Egol in Moscow, and uh, my friend, Konstantin Chimikov, they would all advocate, stop the discussion of no more vaccination with OPV and stop talking about eradicating it because it's not gonna be eradicated, but just get everyone vaccinated, which is still not the case. So I don't, it, it's not an insurmountable problem, it's surmountable. And I didn't say I would, I thought of OPV only because of that lesson in the past, but it's not limited to OPV. There's rotaviruses, there's intranasal flu, there's BCG, there's measles, mumps, rubella. You, you know, I don't want to promote this too much, but many people in the Global Virus Network that are centered directors, we take MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, before the vaccine was available, even now in between boosts. For just boosting innate immunity when we know we're going into a population dense area. If I'm going to travel, and I'm going to be in a population dense area, yeah, I'd like for several weeks to have my innate system alerted because they protect against infection, not against just disease and allowing infection. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's obviously very important. Uh, Aaron asks, what, what's the possibility that an HIV-like retrovirus that attacks the immune system can change its tropism to become a respiratory virus? My best answer to that is in 1988, I was asked that in a press conference in which in the next room, there was another press conference. It was in Stockholm. It was the International AIDS Society meeting. Um, and two scientists, myself and another from Europe, were put in opposite rooms and asked the same question. He said, that it was a good possibility we could have the super virus and um, that made headlines. And my answer would be the same as I said then. If a virus changes its tropism to target T cells, it's giving up its tropism to target my nose and my mouth and my respiratory tract. It can't. Look. Secondly, how many years have we had it? HIV floating around now, it's about 42 years, 43 years, 45 years. The way this virus replicates, the number of people it's infected, you know, it's really a lot of millions of people. Don't you think it would have happened by now? So the answer is, I think that's a, we got a lot of things to worry about. And this is like worrying about tomorrow, the moon's gonna hit the earth. 
So, you know, I don't think that's going to happen and that you have to worry about it. The tropism change would destroy its ability to target T cells rather specifically and macrophage to a certain extent. What is the mechanism whereby BCG affects bladder cancer? I assume it's the same by stimulating toll-like receptors that induce a lot of innate immunity, which is of course used to treat cancers and was pushed in Germany prior to chemotherapy, as you may know. I don't have any experience with it. I've never you know, followed it that carefully, but I assume that the mechanism is probably the same, but that you, you, you develop a lot of interferon, which can block cell proliferation. You develop natural killer cells, which can kill cancer cells, et cetera. So I think it's through innate immunity, yeah. And many people studying innate immunity in terms of cancer today. And it's not something I'm expert on or know a lot about. Uh, in your PNAS paper, and today you referred to a variety of... Uh... It's not funded. It's poorly funded. And yeah. how to do it, how to do it, I... Well, I'm talking, I'll be, well, I'm going to bring you up to date. I'm talking to military because the army looks for that. When they go into, let's say you had to send a large number of soldiers into a funny area near Egypt, let's say, and there was a new outbreak of a respiratory virus infection. You had no idea what it was. Imagine if you had a pill in your pocket. Let's forget OPV or any other vaccine, MMR or anything else, or BCG. This should be convertible, converted rather to be able to be converted to a pill that reacts with the same receptors, that does the same thing that you have in your pocket. And I think that day will come. I don't know when. And but I have a discussion next week with some of the, some group of colonels in the army about this. I mean, I hope, I hope somebody will, will get interested in funding. Are there any, uh, to your knowledge, uh, sort of controlled clinical trials going on with BCG or any other uh, vaccine? Follow, there, yes, there are. There will be a Russian study published, and then people will say, "Oh, it's from Russia." You know, like it doesn't mean, oh, you know. Uh, but there is, and it's positive. Sounds like Metchnikov, where we started. <laughs> <laughs> he, ended up, he ended up moving to Paris. So uh, today he'd move here, maybe, or maybe he'd move to China, I'm not sure. In any case, he, um, yes. So there will, there will be a Russian study published um, and it's with OPV, I guess. And there, is, there have been papers published, s small studies from India and I think also Mexico. And I would follow the best scientist in this field for my money right now is is the guy I mentioned his name many times. Follow the name of N E T E A, Mihai Natea, a Romanian working in Radboud University in Holland. He is a really good scientist. Um, and he's the one who discovered, trained innate immunity from myeloid cell innate immunity. I mean, trained, meaning it last, he, he showed it last much longer than we thought. With BCG, he showed it lasted six months and he knows the mechanism. He's worked out the mechanisms. He gets involved collaboratively in trials and also Michael Avedan at Washington University. And lastly, Christine Stable, funny name, Stable hyphen Ben, two L's, two N, Stable Ben, and her colleague, Peter Abbey, A-A-B-Y. They do a lot of clinical trials. So the answer to the question is yes. Do I know them all? No. And in, for this talk, I asked my friend Hugh McCoffey, he would send me a list of all such papers. And he did about three days ago. And, and let's be open, I forgot to read it. So what, if I read it, I'd know the answer better. But uh, it's somewhere in my stack of on my desk here somewhere and you prime me to read it. Well, if, if you would be kind enough when you get to it, uh, you I'll could send it to you. those references. We'll post it. We'll <laughs> post them on our website because I'm sure the uh, attendees would be very interested in reading such. Uh, Wait, let's remember the animal papers that just came out. 
So the two animal trials just came out. One, a, I think a very interesting study by Alan Shearer of NIH on intravenous BCG protecting mice against lethal challenges with SARS-2. Another is by Raul Andino at UCSF collaborating with a group at Stanford. He's got a fairly sizable group and he showed in animal models uh, in a cell paper, really wonderful data of protection and also using it therapeutically, which one has to be a little careful about if it's too far into the infection process because you wanna take care of the virus but you don't wanna make inflammation augmented in later stages. Uh, there was a question on that score. Their question was whether the cytokine storm that's been observed in some COVID patients could be due to the innate immunity. Not really, no, I don't think so. I mean, I don't know, but I don't think so. Using innate immunity is something that occurs at the beginning, not late. So, and in fact, the cytokines that have been in, invoked are things like IL-6, not really a big part of the innate immunity usually. Uh, so, I don't, you know, the, this is complex when you get late and you get all this inflammation. You don't want to use innate stimulation late, that's for sure. This is there beforehand and early phase. But if you're really sick, <laughs> you know, getting into a cytokine storm and sitting in a respirator, you don't want, any, you don't want somebody sticking you to cause more any kind of anything that would augment inflammation. So. If you look at the symptomatology, uh, at least in the uh, typical uh, COVID case where there are symptoms, what symptoms would you ascribe likely as due to the innate immune system? Well, you know, every time I mentioned that, well, at my age, probably there's been 100, 200. How many times have we been infected and the next day we're well? What were your symptoms? Well, they're either nothing. And what are your symptoms after a vaccination? What do you think it's due to? It's due to innate immunity. What are they usually? Nothing, or maybe a little headache maybe a chill, maybe a low-grade fever, fatigue. Those are it. Those are the main things. Those are interferon symptoms, mainly. So, I mean, I don't know what more I, I can say. I don't think in late stage you're talking about that. You're now talking about a great deal of destruction, of a, a lot of vascular destruction. And um, I don't know. I, I just read somebody who has a hypothesis about Brady kinin causing the bulk of the pathogenesis. There's, you know, I mean, it's, it's a mess. A lot of cells are, I, I don't know how much the immune system has a role here. A lot of it is direct viral. I think even late, we don't even know that late COVID, so-called late COVID, we don't know that's due to immunity. It may be well that virus is still there. Who's proven virus is not still there a year later? I just thought, I. As you know, with those, I just had knee surgery and the person doing my physical therapy told me that her brother is a year and two months later, he still can't taste or smell. I mean, do we know it's not virus still left in somewhere between his nasal passages, his olfactory nerves or the brain itself? Uh, yeah, that's... I guess we still don't know, or do, do, you, do you know? What do we know is the mechanism of chronic uh, COVID? I don't know. And I bet you not too many people know, or maybe nobody. I don't know. It's, it, you know, you ask a question that is the main subject of our global virus network meetings now related to SARS-2. Should we be thinking of what do we know? Uh, and I think, this is going to go, not going to go anywhere. We're going to need all our clinicians together and we're going to get the same description, but I think we know very little. I mean, we can bring up good hypotheses that are interesting, but we don't know very much. It's post-mortem really that we're going to have to rely on. And there are not that many that are available for detailed study, but I think it's going to come from post-mortem studies. Uh, interestingly, we have a... Uh a session in this uh, uh, course on chronic COVID on March 29th with the uh, uh, Walter Korschutz, who's the director of 
NINDS, and Josh Gordon, who's the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. So we'll see what emerges at that point. Uh, there's a question as to whether uh, antigen specificity of the CD8 T cell, T cell receptor can be different in different organs, playing a role in uh, mm -hmm. what organ is affected, say uh, the oral mucosa versus, uh, or the oral pharynx versus the lungs. Is there any evidence for antigen specificity of CD8 T cell receptors? Um, my, my, the words I say we don't use enough, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know that, that if there's anything in the literature that describes that. I don't see, think anything unreasonable about it, though. It seems reasonable that there could be variation. Certainly different organs have different numbers of T cells and, different, and sometimes the markers are very different to different degrees of activation, different degrees of differentiation. Um, so why not? I, I suspect it's likely to be the case, but I, I can't quote literature that knows that. There was, there was one about whether Omicron came from an HIV infected person because it came out of South Africa. Reasonable, we've certainly thought about it. There's no proof of it. Right. I'm trying to hear her. All right, darn it. I'm having, sorry about that. I'm having some difficulty with my chat box here. There are a couple of questions that just arrived. So that's the minute. If I see one that you haven't said, do you want me to read it? Sure. I see one that says, do the current vaccines from China stimulate innate immunity effectively? Um, I don't think so. I, I doubt it. I mean, it pretty, most of the ones from China that I'm aware of are really make, really carrying a gene, and the gene by a vector, and then it's expressed that protein. It wouldn't be necessarily very powerful. Depends how much replication there is. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it would be likely to be powerful and make immune stimulators. I don't think any of them very much are. Uh, I'm sorry, just a minute. Well, there's a, there's another quite a big fast so asked how the how does polio vaccine last a lifetime? How do any why polio? Yeah, you you, you know uh, Jay. Chung, you asked that question. Why do you ask me about polio? Like you could ask about anything. Why does anything last a lifetime? Because it's lucky that the right B cell that lives, that converts to plasma cells that are mature and that is find the right niche in the bone marrow. That's what we know when they make antibodies that, that are, uh, get to what we call the gamma stage of the immune response of an antibody. Um, and those just go on and on and on. Um, it's, this, it's the differentiation of the B cell to the right plasma cell and why some B cells do it and some don't. Mm -hmm. know. And you know what, that, that polio and many of our vaccines that last lifetime, all the vaccines that last lifetime have to do that. They have to stimulate their B cell that responds to the epitopes that have been used in that vaccine last a long time. I think in the future, we'll see that become part of vaccine development. We'll be looking for specific B cells that convert to plasma cells with fast assays from um, that we were able to do in blood rather than bone marrow. We're trying to develop that actually, um, such studies. Uh, Bob, we have a question for you from John Gallon. He says, thank you, Bob. Innate immunity, as you said, is complex. We can learn from patients with inborn defects of the innate immune system. Patients with chronic granulomatous disease respond to vaccines normally and do not have viral infections as part of their clinical picture. 
a patient we follow with RIK4 deficiency of the total receptor pathway also does well. Do you think studies of the group of patients with defective innate immunity would be one method to dissect the importance of specific components of the innate immunity system in host responses to vaccination and viral disease? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, did. I, I don't know, know about those patients, but yes, John, I think it's a very good idea. Frankly speaking, my bias would have been that if you have serious mutations that affect innate immunity, you won't live past one year. I wouldn't have thought it possible because we get so many infections in, in early in life and exposure to things that you wonder how they could survive. But yes, if you've got such a patient population, you could conceive of it as being invaluable. Right. Let's see. Wait, wait a minute. Yeah. What? After? Yeah, that hold it. Well, <laughs> Rob asked the same question that I uh, floated up to you a little while ago. Uh, why is? I mean innate immunity studied so little? I wish I were smarter. <laughs> Wiser. I, I yeah. don't know. I mean, one possibility is that a lot of vaccine research is certainly and properly driven by pharmaceutical companies, right? Uh, the consequence of that would be that that's not going to be able to be affordable. I mean, it, I don't criticize the pharmaceutical industry. They have to, they have to survive, and somebody has to develop the regular vaccines. And so, I think they don't drive it in this direction. And so, there's not a lot of um, spin-off research from countless people that interact with the pharmaceutical industry and collaborate with them. So it's, you know, understudied. Uh, I, I partly that may be one part of the reason. Uh, I think in this case because it's not, we're not used to thinking about it. I, I don't want to go through the personal things of people that I talked with, but you could see that if I was ignorant when I was first starting out about the importance of this area, um, I didn't find many people who weren't already in the problem any better informed. In fact, a lot worse informed. So I was surprised. So I think it's just an underappreciated area of research. It's one of the areas that needs to get filled in. And we need clinical trials with it, and we need funding. Um, it's not been an interest to NIH. I, I, you know, I don't know. You know, I see a question there by, with the same exact name as my cousin, who's a musician, <laughs> and he plays in a symphony. But it can't be him. There's no way he would be asking a science question. Same exact name, Ron Capoletti. It's the same name as. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, that's, uh, was it, Ju yes, Juliet's name. The Capulets or Capulettis from Verona. Anyway, he, uh, he, he your, asked. Your cousin asks to discuss <laughs> what evidence currently exists about the efficacy of innate immunity in COVID. Well, I try, well Ron, I mean, you, you probably are my cousin to ask that. <laughs> you, should, you weren't paying attention to anything. Well, what I said in the middle of the talk, there's a lot of evidence. I try to summarize it. Beginning, what, for me, Valachandran and his group's paper from Stanford showing that the correlates of, of doing well before the vaccines were innate immune correlates. There's a host of stuff. Uh, it, the animal studies that I just mentioned, the clinical studies that I've mentioned, um, the studies with interferon and correlations that I mentioned, the evidence that the, this virus carries at least three genes to try to avoid innate immunity. Why is it doing that when it doesn't have much genetic information to survive that it's so worried about it? So I, I should send you my slides, Ron. Please let me know if you're my cousin, Ron Kapolej. <laughs> uh, Luba, there's a question. What do you plan for your next book? Is it immunity <laughs> and perhaps COVID? <laughs> no, no, not, no plans at the moment. 
All right. Well, listen, I, on behalf of all the people uh, listening and for all of us, we want to thank both of you for taking the time. It's now almost midnight in uh, Israel, so thank you especially. And it's a pleasure to, uh, to meet you at last, Luba. And Bob, thank you really, really much for provoking and stimulating and presenting a ver very exciting perceptive way of causing us to all, uh, uh, everybody to take a hard look at where we think we are. Uh, thank you. I just want to just mention two things. Dan Kastner uh, and I are associates in this program, and he's going to chair the next three sessions of this course, as I will be in a, a part of the world where we're not sure about how reliable the connections are going to be. Uh, and the next uh, session is on February 1st, and the speakers are Mike Leonardo of NIAID and Helen Su. Defining genes underlying Mendelian immunological disorders leads to precision medicine interventions. I'm sure it will be a very exciting presentation. So thank you all very much and stay thank well. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.